Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. There are several approaches that one might take to this wonderful parable of the laborers that we have here in Matthew 20. Uh, often referred to perhaps as a title in your Bible as the parable of the workers in the vineyards. Uh, one of it, of course, one of the approaches, and this was a very popular approach to all of the parables of Jesus at one time in the early church, and it's called the allegorical approach. And the allegorical approach is very simple. You simply take all of the characters or all of the images in a particular parable, and they correspond one to one with some other character. Uh, so it says the master of the house. Well, the master would be God, the house would be the kingdom, right, the heaven. Uh, uh, went out to get laborers. Well, the laborers would be the people of the world. And you go on and you simply allegorize the parable. And so you, you try to gr grab some meaning out of it from the allegory. Uh, that that it, it's like a, an Aesop fable or something. Okay? Well, parables aren't really that. Parables are much more than that. Uh, this, this way of interpreting Scripture was abandoned rather uh, early in the church, uh, although there are still some that do it. You could put the uh, emphasis on the work, for instance. Let's say this parable, since it's called the parable of the workers in the vineyard, and it's titled that way in many Bibles, then we simply put our emphasis on the workers. We put the emphasis on who the workers are, uh, uh, how much the workers are getting paid, where the workers are going, who's hiring them. Uh, you put your emphasis all on the workers, how they respond to what they get paid and all that. So your emphasis could be that. Uh, maybe one might focus on uh, uh, each individual workers or the workers who came late as opposed to the ones that came early. You might have another one in which you point out the unique vision of the master. So this master has this great vision uh, for this great vineyard that he has. And he, he needs laborers in that vineyard. And so he's going out at all times to get these laborers. Early, late, doesn't matter. He wants everybody in his vineyard. Doesn't matter who you are. Come in and, and, and labor in this wonderful vineyard that uh, the Lord has established so that you might have work. You might be able to be part of the great harvest. And still other approaches take the kingdom references and talk about it's all, it's all about the kingdom of God and that sort of thing. Now, I would say that in the last 1,500 years, millions of sermons have been preached on this on this particular parable. Uh, if you take every community of every Christians everywhere in the world, I'm sure someone has given some approach to it. I'm going to take a, a, an approach that may not be unique uh, approach to it, but I want to approach this parable uh, as Jesus communicating really uh, in this parable about the intent of the Father. What the intent of the Father is. And that the intent of the Father is to bring into his kingdom as many as will respond to the call. And that what is important is that the call goes out. It's never too early and it's never too late to give the call. I mean, he went out early in the morning to call the laborers. He went out at the last, at twilight to call the workers. It's never too late to give out this call of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the salvation of the world to people. So why don't we approach, if we approach the gospel that way, or this particular parable that way, then how are we going to view it? Well, if we allow it to be really about seeking and saving the lost, and Jesus said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. And if that's what the parable is about, okay, if it's about going out all the time throughout why you have light, Jesus says, we work while it is day, for the night is coming when no one can work. Okay, well, if we're going to work in the day, that is the day that we have to preach the Word of God, to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ into the world, if that's what this is about, then we, it's about seeking the lost. It's about bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to the lost in every possible context of the vineyard of God, which is His entire safe world, or in the entire world seeking salvation. After all, Jesus characterized his, uh, his uh, uh, coming into the world as saving the lost, Luke 19.10, Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. And what is the context of Luke 19 where he said that? Well, the context is, of course, on the road to Jericho. And who does he run into sitting up in a sycamore, sycamore fig tree on the road to Jericho? Who does he run into? Zacchaeus. Now, I know my learning center people know that because they sing that little song, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. 
though. I know that they know the story. So Zacchaeus is this terrible tax collector, right? He is Jewish, but he's a tax collector. He's a thief. Uh, he, a lot of things wrong with Zacchaeus, and he was a short man, very short. And so he couldn't see Jesus for the crowd, so he climbs up in this tree so he can see him. Okay, when Jesus sees him then, he calls him down from the tree and he says, I'm eating in your house today. So he goes to his house, and, and when Zacchaeus receives the good news, which is the receiving of Jesus, he immediately repents of his thievery, repents of his uh, cheating the people in, 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 the, in his tax office, through his tax office, I mean, and gives away his stuff, right? And then Jesus says to this, Today salvation has come to this house, for this too is a son of Abraham. In other words, this person has been saved by faith, just as Abraham was. He believed, repented, now he is saved. And so what Jesus is saying here is that the task of the Son of Man is to save the save of the lost. Well, if we look at the parable from that context, then what are we seeing? What is it that the Master says to the people at the 11th hour? Why are you still standing around idle? And what is their response? Is their response is because we're lazy. We're happy being idle. Because I don't want to jeopardize my government check by going to work. I mean, is that what they say? That is not what they say. They say, rather, I no one has called us. No one has invited us into this vineyard. We've not been told about the good news of you hiring people out there in your vineyard. Even at the 11th hour, there are those who are hungry for this message of Jesus Christ in their life. And we live in a world that is literally dying on the vine for a lack of those who are receiving this call into this luscious vineyard of the Lord. The heart of Jesus is to seek out the lost, to bring them into a saving relationship with the Father. And that's the hallmark of His mission. The hallmark of Jesus' mission was to do that. In John 10, 16, we read this. I have other sheep that are not of this sheepfold. What did he mean by that? In other words, he said, there are sheep out there that I as a good shepherd have been called, have been come to call into this sheepfold, this sheepfold, which is the sheepfold of the Father. I am the good shepherd. That's how 10 starts, okay? I am the good shepherd. And he says, I have other sheep that are not of the sheepfold. That is the sheepfold of the, of the uh, natural uh, uh, physical descendants of Abraham, the people of Israel. That's the original flock of God that God formed out of Egypt. Okay? So uh, he said, but I have others. And this is what he says. I must bring them also. Do you, do you get the urgency there? I must bring them also. It's like the master who, uh, uh, it, it, you know, the harvest is ready, the harvest is ready. He has to bring these. He has to go and get these guys and bring them to this place. You know, you can drive down, drive down Beaufort Highway or uh, East Ponce or anything. You see these guys standing around waiting for somebody to come and just give them a job for that day. Right? Well, these guys are standing around. He must do this. I must bring them also. Why? Two reasons. They too will listen to my voice. In other words, the scripture tells us that the word of God goes out. We even sang it in our hymn. That when the word of God goes out, it does not come back void. It does what he sent it for. Now, when we go out and preach the gospel, and, and we throw out the gospel seed, so to speak, we don't know what ground is falling on. But whatever ground it falls on, it's going to produce something. Because it will not come back to the Father void. He says, they too will listen to my voice. I must call them. because, And why must I call Because they're going to listen. The Holy Spirit is out there preparing people to listen. They're going to listen. And then what does he say? Then there will be one flock and one shepherd. There will be the one flock and the one shepherd of the saved earth. Of the saved of the earth. The one shepherd, the one flock. And so Jesus, I think, uh, here, even in this parable of the vineyard worker, has in mind the lost, has in mind those who are just idle in, in, the, in, the, in, in the world and not uh, even engaged. They want to be. There may even be seekers of the truth. 
The Holy Spirit may be working in all kinds of people to receive the truth of Jesus. But if nobody tells them, if they never receive it, if they're not workers out there to do it, then we can see the problem. We live in a world of lost people. Lost people. Some of them know they're lost, and some of them don't. Some of them don't know how to get out of their lost conditions, and others don't care. But there are always those who are seeking a better way, seeking a way to be acceptable to God, because in their current condition, they know they're not. they are always those people. They're lost from the flock of God. They're not in His flock, but they're the ones Jesus says in John 10 that He must also call so that they will listen to Him. They're lost from the vineyard of the sweet work and the sweeter fruit of the vineyard of God. They're lost from that work. There is sweetness in the work that we do in the vineyard of Christ. There's sweetness in seeing people come to faith in Jesus Christ. There's sweetness in seeing people's lives transformed by the, by the power of the gospel working in their lives. They're lost from the generosity of the Master. It is the Father's desire to pour down His gifts upon us. Pour down His gifts upon us. That's what He wants to do. He wants to gift us. That's why He created the universe, so that He could, what? Gift us, those whom He created. They're lost. And where are they lost? They're lost in the throes of slavery, either real physical slavery or spiritual slavery. They're lost in poverty, many of them in real physical poverty, but some of them in the poverty of the spirit. They just have poor spirits. Their spirit has not been enriched by the gospel. They're lost in disease, uh, which is uh, in, in some cases their own fault that they're in disease uh, uh, from addiction or, or from uh, uh, lifestyle. There are those who are lost in terror and war who simply need the good news of Jesus Christ, that this is not what life is all about. There are those who are lost in persecution who need to have the encouragement of the Spirit from those who know the good news. These sheep must be brought also into the flock of the one shepherd. With that in mind, I want to give just one illustration this morning. It's a lengthy one, but I do want to share this illustration because a lot of us, especially in view of the uh, uh, dominant uh, international news, certainly one of the dominant international news stories over the last couple of weeks, is the advance of the Islamic State. And so, and, and the atrocities being uh, uh, perpetrated by it. And so, and we know that Christians are suffering rather, rather severely under this in particular. But uh, all the same, uh, we don't want to forget that the good news is for them too. Uh, it's hard for us to think that, but God wants the good news for them as well. And so I want to talk about one person who has taken this very, very seriously. This idea that really what life is about is to share the good news as much as possible. And in particular, to try to share that good news with those who need it the most. Those who need it the most. His name is uh, Father Zachariah Botros. Uh, Botros is his last name. He's now 70 years of age. He's in his, in his 70s. Nobody knows exactly how old he is. He is a Muslim. He grew up in Cairo, Egypt. As a, as a Muslim, uh, uh, Zakhar Boutros. Some of you may remember that one of the head, head of the United Nations used to be called Boutros, Boutros Ghali, remember? Some of you may remember his name. Boutros was this guy's name, his uh, given name. I mean, his family name. Uh, he converted to Christianity as a very young man and later joined the Coptic Christians, which is the dominant Christian uh, uh, denomination there in Egypt, been there since you know, the time of the uh, early, early church. And so he became a Coptic uh, uh, Christian, a Coptic priest, uh, uh, in the 1950s. He was twice jailed because he preached to Muslims. So twice he was put in jail. The second time he was put in jail, he was given the option. You can remain in jail for life without the um, uh, possibility of ever being paroled. Or you can accept permanent exile from Egypt. Be exiled from Cairo, exiled from your family, and you can never return. He chose exile. He chose exile. And uh, by that time, in 1989, he chose exile. Uh, he had been in Cairo for 30 years, not only ministering in the Coptic Church, but also preaching to Muslims. He and his wife then, of course, immigrated to England first. There he uh, carried, uh, he uh, 
uh, was the head of a congregation there, a Coptic congregation, for about 11 years there. But upon retiring, um, his all-out television evangelistic ministry began uh, to bring as many Muslims as possible under the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was his vision. And he saw that when he was in England. When he saw in England um, how so many Muslims were coming to England, but they were being separated. They were not being witnessed to. They were, they were separate, they were having their own community and that sort of thing. He said, what really needs to happen is that the gospel needs to go to this community. So in, in 2008, his efforts were recognized uh, by World Magazine, and he was awarded the Daniel of the Year Award in 2008 for his preaching of the Word. He now lives in an undisclosed location in the United States of America. It's undisclosed. And it has to be because there are thousands of fatwas against him. A fatwa is a death sentence. has been put against him. And so he has to live in total seclusion. He has to live no hardly... Anyone but the very closest and most trusted people know where he lives or where he is. Now, what is he doing? He uses the state-of-the-art technology, state-of-the-art technology, to bypass all the efforts of the Islamic governments to keep the gospel out of their countries. And he's overcoming all of that. He is directly challenging through media, social media, uh, television and radio, he is... Uh, Constantly, constantly challenging the claims of Muhammad as the prophet, the claims of the Quran as the word of God. He systematically deconstructs Muhammad's life story by story, pointing out the characteristic flaws, the sinful behavior from uh, uh, Islamic sources, not from Western historical sources. He carefully uh, uh, is careful uh, very much to be truthful about all that he says and has uh, plenty of evidence for what he says. He... Uh, unapologetically, he talks about his beliefs. He talks about the beliefs of Islam being wrong. He goes on to teach that Muslims uh, 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 need to turn to Jesus Christ from the Bible, as even from the Quran, and talks about Jesus. That Jesus loves them, that Jesus wants them to be saved. He wants them to come into his flock. He is the good shepherd. And no matter what they have done, he will forgive them and accept them because he loves them. There was one Palestinian who came to faith in Jesus Christ through these broadcasts who himself had been involved in bombings and killing of Israeli soldiers. He has a 90-minute television program uh, each week, uh, which is a combination of preaching and teaching, answering questions, usually from irate callers uh, who are calling in from all over the world. Uh, his his program has become must-see must TV throughout all the Muslim world because it's, it's taped and, of course, is put out all over the world. Get it on the Internet. It's everywhere. It's replayed uh, four times a week in Arabic, his native language, on a satellite television which is called Aliyat, which means the life, uh, the life TV. Uh, he can be seen, of course, all over North Africa, the Middle East. He can be seen in Central Asia all over the European countries, uh, Australia, North America, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it can be seen in many places, in fact, uh, and is estimated, it's estimated, 50 million Muslims see his program every day. 50 million Muslims. Because of the access of the internet, the access of media and stuff, it can be easily seen anywhere on the, in the world. At the same time, he is getting millions of hits on his multiple websites. He has all kinds of websites. Anywhere where you can have a website, Facebook, any place where you can be, he gets hits on these places. Muslims can read his sermons. They can uh, study what he has to do, his archived uh, sermons. He answers questions. All, every question that he answers uh, from a Muslim is archived. Anybody can look it up later if they want to. He even has a, has a pal chat section on the Internet where you can actually talk back and forth uh, with somebody who is uh, uh, in his organization that can answer any questions that a Muslim might have. Um, many are coming to Christ. If, 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 it is, uh, if it's an indication of what the number of people that are confessing Christ after they talk with one of his trained counselors, if that is any indication, it appears, it would appear that literally thousands of uh, uh, Muslims are making a testimony of Christ or uh, uh, a profession of faith. 
Uh, in 2003, uh, his name became a household world in the Muslim world. The Arabic newspaper, one Arabic newspaper, says he's Islam's public enemy number one. Public enemy one. Millions hate him, uh, certainly, uh, but they're still watching. He, he's, he's the guy they love to hate. You know, If you've got a guy you love to hate, you watch him anyway, don't you? And that's the way it is with him. And uh, everybody's trying to pick apart what he presents, but, but they can't do it. He challenges the radical clerics to call into his program uh, and he, uh, when he's refuting Islam. He calls them to, co to, to uh, call in. And uh, uh, people are listening to hear what the fundamentalist Muslims are saying to him. So they're listening because they, they want their Quran to be, uh, to be uh, verified. They want it to be justified. They follow it. It's, they, many have it memorized. Okay, so these clerics will call in and yet they end up simply attacking him because they cannot attack the Injil of Jesus. They have no words that, that will... That... See, the gospel's like that. The gospel has that kind of power when we present it. And so they basically end up just slamming him and calling, calling for his death and that sort of thing. Does that not have an effect on those that are hearing it? Of course it does. Yet the more the radicals attack him, the more he becomes well-known. And the more well-known he becomes, then of course the more Muslims feel compelled to tune into his program. And the more the Muslims tune in, the more are coming to the conclusion that he's right. And they're turning and choosing to become followers of Isa, Jesus. Father Zechariah Botros estimates that a thousand Muslims a month, a thousand a month are coming to faith in Jesus through his ministry, uh, which is worldwide and reaches 50 million. So, you know, that's not a huge number that's coming, but still there are those that are coming. Some of them uh, pray to receive Christ on the, on the air. Others, uh, um, are, uh, and he believes it's just the tip of the iceberg because there are millions of, of, of listeners who can't call in. There's just not enough people manning the phones that they can all call in. He does not believe that all Muslims are radicals, obviously, and they're not. Anyone who believes that is, is, is just being naive. All Muslims are not radical uh, or been radicalized. That's only a very small percentage. But he does believe that all Muslims are spiritually lost, and that's the key thing. They're lost. They're lost. And, and the world they're lost in is not a friendly one. Uh, the world they're lost in is a desperate one. And, and he, he wishes to bring them into the uh, uh, truth of the Good Shepherd and the Gospel. Uh, he wants desperately for them to know that they're forgiven and that, they're, that they're, uh, they have been reconciled with God through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And they can have a relationship with God. That's something a Muslim can't have. He can't have a personal relationship with Allah. You can't. But you can have a personal relationship with God because of Jesus Christ. Now, it's, it's interesting how, how people out there in the field refer to Think about this. I mean, I can come here and just recite the things that are known about, you know, Father Boatrice. But what are other people saying that are really out there in the Muslim community, really out there engaging uh, the Muslim community? Well, one of them is Raymond Ibrahim. Raymond Ibrahim is a recognized expert on Al-Qaeda. Uh, he is the translator and the editor of the Al-Qaeda Reader, which is really is the book of understanding who Al-Qaeda is. But he's also the Shul, uh, Shulman a Fellow at the David Horowitz uh, uh, Freedom Center. This is what he has to say about what Father Botrus is doing. He says, Botrus's motive is not to incite the West against Islam, promote Israeli interests, or demonize Muslims, but to draw Muslims away from the dead legalism of Sharia to the spirituality of Christianity. Many Western critics fail to appreciate that to disempower radical Islam, something theocentric, that is with God at the center, and spiritually satisfying, something that reaches into the inner spirit of somebody. Not secularism, not democracy, not capitalism, not materialism or anything else that the West has to offer. But if we want to disempower radicalism, it must be replaced with something theocentric. It must be offered in its place. Something that has God at the center. And what has God at the center that the West has to offer? 
What more than the message of Jesus Christ, the saving gospel of our Savior? What more of a theocentric and gracious thing do we have to offer from the West? And that is the only thing that's going to replace it. It's not going to be replaced with our lifestyle and our uh, capital, uh, our capitalism and our prosperity and our, and our engineering and uh, our education, um, our culture. None of that's going to replace it. It will be replaced by the powerful gospel of Jesus Christ. The truths of one religion can only be challenged and supplanted by the truths of another. And so Father Botrus has been uh, fighting fire with fire. Spiritual war with spiritual power. I believe this is the hand of God, Father Buttress told me. He is directing me. He shows me what to say. He shows me what to write on the websites. He's showing me more and more how to use technology to reach people with the message of redemption. He may be the, 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 the St. Paul to the, to the Muslim community that Paul was to the Gentile community that Luther was for the Western European community. Follow? He's, he's, he's addressing them directly where they live with what directly they need, and that is freedom from the slavery, from the slavery of sin, from the slavery of a false faith, false religion, to the true God, the one who forgives and loves and gives and, and strengthens and, and, and heals and provides and gives spiritual satisfaction. In two weeks, uh, our trust, for instance, the trust that you are assisting with uh, Solomon Rajnaka, who works in uh, Hyderabad, India, and in the environs around Hyderabad, our uh, evangelist will go uh, to, he's actually leaving this Thursday, and he will go to uh, do a dental camp at the, at the hospital we're, we're sponsoring, but he will go on then to work with Solomon and preach to, to over 10,000 people the gospel of Jesus Christ. By the time he goes to all the locations he'll be going to, Probably over 10,000 people hear the gospel. In an area that is, the areas he goes to are mainly Hindu, Muslim, and communist. Communist. Because one town he does go into is a communist headquarters town, and the PM from that area that is in the, leg, is in the parliament in India, uh, in Delhi, is from that area is a communist, Marxist communist. So these are the areas he's going into to preach the good news about Jesus Christ about the one. So the voice of the master continues to be heard in our day throughout the world among those who are seeking a meaningful life with God, hungering for the work of the vineyard of a gracious Lord, to not be working in this world for things that do not last, but working for the Lord unto an eternal harvest. There are people who want that. And the good news goes out. And so we sang in our hymn this morning. What did we sing? Hark the voice of Jesus calling. Who will go and work today? Fields are white and harvest waiting. Who will bear the sheaves away? Rich reward he offers you. Who will answer gladly saying, Here am I. Send me. Send me. There is hope. There's hope in the face of these terrible atrocities that are being perpetrated on our dear brethren in Iraq and, and Syria. The, the necessary work of the governing authorities who do not bear the sword in vain, as St. Paul tells us, uh, will be prosecuted against the ungodly. This will be prosecuted against the ungodly. Romans chapter uh, 13, verse 4. The, 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 the state does not bear the sword in vain. It will punish the malefactor. Okay? And that has to be done. That has to be part of it. But it can't be the only thing. It's not the only way to approach it. Real change comes from true conversion. True change, true repentance, true turning around, true calling into the flock of a good shepherd, into the, into the vineyard of a gracious master, the one gracious master, God our Savior. And the transformation of our world, where followers of Jesus Christ are not wantonly persecuted and, and killed, not even ruthlessly slaughtered, but nonetheless in the latter days, especially in the, these latter days we live, the foremost message of Jesus Christ and His salvation is to go out. And there is to be a harvest unto the vineyard of the Lord. There is a series of, of DVDs that highlight these courageous, courageous laborers 
of the vineyard in our world. It's entitled Dispatches from the Front in the Missions. Dispatches from the Front in the Missions. It comes from Taylor, South Carolina. Uh, it's wonderful. If you want to see what is really happening in the world, what is really, really happening with regard to the gospel of Jesus Christ and how it is reaching people and transforming lives, that's just one. There's many uh, other opportunities. That's just one that comes to mind now. The master voice is challenging us. In your context, where you live, the people you work with, go to school with, right there now, he's challenging us in this parable, calling out who will go and work today. And we are going to say what? Here I am. Send me. Send me. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let that peace of God, therefore, that passes our human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.